Peter Fogel and Kelly Kittel. Right. Welcome to Mr. What Presented, guys. So happy to see you and have you here talk about the mysteries, the arcane origins of this wonderful show that we are reprising at Thrill Peddlers starting this week. Uh, it began in, Peter and I started working together in 1998, 98. Uh, there was a rock and roll band, uh, drag band called Enrique that had these most outrageous uh, rock musicals. Uh, they broke up and left a vacuum here and if there's anything drag queens abhor is a vacuum and stage uh, time. So uh, Peter and I got together to pick up that. Um, I had experience writing musicals before. Uh, I had written one called Hillbillies on the Moon, which was the world's first dykebilly, uh, all-female, all-dyke uh, musical uh, about Hillbillies on the Moon. So Peter had also had a lot of history in rock and roll throughout uh, San Francisco's uh, history. I used to play guitar in this big Las Vegas production review known as Enrique. Mm -hmm. We used to open for bands at the Fillmore, uh, Bjorn Again, um, mm -hmm. who was the Neil Diamond band? Oh, right. Uh, okay. Diamond Forever or something like that. Anyway, so we used to get lots of big gigs and we, and we played um, you know, all the big shows, uh, all the big venues here in San Francisco. And the last uh, show that we did with uh, Jason Messier and Darcy Drollinger was called Above and Beyond the Valley of the Ultra mm -hmm. Showgirls, which was loosely based on Suzanne, uh, what is her name, Suzanne, Jacqueline Pichette, I can't, right. <laughs> can't remember her name, um, but Jacqueline she wrote, Suzanne. Jacqueline Suzanne, that's it, uh, she wrote Valley of the Dolls and then also uh, mixed in with Showgirls, so it was very much like a big stew, a big drag stew. Um, but that show was a huge success, and then when Enrique, when Darcy moved to uh, New York and Enrique folded, we thought, well, let's continue this momentum that we've got going. I'd written tons of rock and roll songs in the past with Darcy and other bands, and so it was just a natural thing for Kelly and I to collaborate. In fact, Kelly, if I'm not mistaken, you were Sally... Sassy Jelly Raphael, is that her name? Yeah, I hosted Hosting her. the Enrique Farewell Show, which, which was an amazing in itself. But that was sort of the genesis of the Tuck and Roll Players, which is where uh, we wrote our first show called Cyberotica, which was um, just quickly based on the whole Y2K experience and Doomsday happening at midnight on New Year's Eve. Uh, it was also about trannies. Oops, I'm not supposed to say that word no, anymore. anymore. Transgender people taking over the internet, and it had a lot of crazy stuff going on and kooky production values. Yeah, but Peter, the weirdest thing about that show is how much of it came true. We had uh, we had uh, anthrax poisoning and planes falling out of the sky and the religious right uh, trying taking over the government cross-dressing terrorists cr going into government sites and blowing them up yeah which just happened what two months ago a few months back right. yeah so mm -hmm. it was it was creepy that we wrote this show about a possible future and then slowly see it come to life and that was that was ridiculous theater so we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of uh, success from that and it was a big underground hit and so Peter and I decided that we wanted to write the next show, Club Inferno. I approached Peter with uh, several ideas of shows that I wanted to do, but this was the one show that was closest to my heart. I had read Inferno when I was mm -hmm. young because I looked at a lot of different religions, I studied a lot of different religions, and although the heavens were all different if they had a heaven, the hells were all the same, and they all involved fire and torture and monsters. Yeah. And so the definitive book was Dante's uh, Club Inferno and the Divine Comedy. The, yeah, the Divine. <laughs> the, the, the Inferno divine. is actually the first of the right. series, right? The right. trilogy. Uh, and uh, the Inferno, lucky for us, was broken down already into segments or acts. So this level happens. This level happens. Uh, the hardest part for Peter and I was deciding who would populate each level um, because we had to match up the sin with the uh -huh. uh, level itself. Uh, and that, that, I say it was hard, but it was also fun to go through who died and how they died and for the reasons that they died. The show is not... Go ahead. Can I just ask you, though, wasn't Cleopatra in the original Club Cle of... Cle original Dante's Divine Comedy? Yes. In the, in the level of the lustful, if yes, I'm not mistaken. Exactly. So we had that to go on. She was our first celebrity that we found on... The, I believe it was the second level of hell, being that the first is Limbo. Wow. Um, so we So we started there, and then we we sort of took off um, with um, different female celebrities 
um, going going on the journey. But but one of the things that I'm really proud of is if you have read the Inferno, you will recognize the stu touchstones that we have kept throughout the story, and it may have changed the look of it, but the uh, the uh, the uh, the character is still there. Instead of having an avenging angel come to the city of Dis. We have Durga come and destroy the harpies there. Mm -hmm. um, things like that uh, make the show fun to watch, uh, especially if you've read mm -hmm. The Inferno. But if you haven't read The Inferno, it's still the story about a midlife crisis, mm -hmm. which is general to all, uh, you know, happens. So midlife crisis, and uh, is the intention to entertain, to educate, a little bit of both? You mentioned uh, how the t sick and twisted players uh, influence your style or your desire to make theater by picking up a serious sort of classic like this one, turning it into drag, uh, I guess creating some brand new, a different way to educate, or what is the intent? Well, the, uh, the Sick and Twisted Player was what I call a refrigerator box uh, theater company, and that their uh, backgrounds were literally refrigerator boxes. And they had the lowest production values, but they had these um, faithful audiences, this huge cold following uh, for these rinky-dink shows. And what I realized is that audiences want to be entertained. Audiences want to stretch their imagination. Um, what is, uh, it's, it's nice to have a chandelier fall through the ceiling. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be a literal, literal chandelier. The audience's imagination will take them there. We reprised, we did a live production of the, uh, of the Poseidon Adventure, including with the ship turning over. Oh, you guys were involved with that Yeah, one? we were. I have seen it online. Yeah, and it was incredible because the audience was well aware of it. But they, it was kind of funny because they were aware of it. They knew when the ship was going to get washed with, mm -hmm. you know, when some water was coming. And you could hear them moaning in fear because they would get doused with buckets of water. And it was just that uh, kind of awareness that audiences really want to have fun. And, and one of the things that we learned with Enrique was that same thing, is that uh, you do not need high production values. What you need is a good story and action and great characters and great uh, actors and uh, people to play those. What I think is really interesting, though, is that Club Inferno actually works on a few different levels. There's the surface level of just the drag and the sparkly outfits and the, the songs themselves. And big numbers. Completely works on that level. But then if you want to go a little bit deeper and read more about Dante's Divine uh, Comedy, you realize that there's all these different tie-ins that happen. And that's Kelly's genius with the story, is that he, he really knew... Uh, the Divine Comedy and researched it and, and we sort of molded Club Inferno into, uh, into the story of, of Dante taking, uh, going on the journey with Virgil, Virgil guiding Dante through the nine le levels of hell. But what was also really fun about creating Club Inferno was that we would just riff on ideas and Kelly would just, um, you know, rattle off a song title, okay, this one is called Love is Hell. Uh, this one is called The Road to Fame, and this one is called Little White Lies. And I would go, okay, I got it, I'm going to take it from there. And then he would give me uh, maybe some samples, maybe some ideas of, okay, this one's more of a gospel number. This one is a touching, uh, you know, a heartbreaking ballad. This one is a super, you know, a heavy metal rocker. And so we would just kind of navigate those lanes and figure out what would work and what didn't work. So it really sort of just came off of riffing ideas, all of the songwriting at least. We just sort of... Um, took it and ran with it. But Peter, there's also one third level that we've kept, uh, that was paramount, and it was, it is what a slippery road to hell fame can be, and right. whether you really want to walk that path, right. because it, That's a surprising message coming from show writers. I mean, there's of course the irony of it, but I, I was wondering about, you know, uh, why you would want to give that message to aspiring actors and thespians and uh, is there like some personal history in there or, or is it something, do you think that the rise to fame is inherently wicked? I think, uh, I think it's a hard, she, she's, a, she's a bitch goddess and she's very fickle and she gives and she takes and we have seen people who have become absolutely twisted in their quest for fame. Uh, and once they taste it, it's like a drug, and they they will uh, mm -hmm. debase themselves to get it to get there again, or or descend into drugs or some type of other mm -hmm. behavior. But uh, as the uh, great philosopher Sharon Osbourne pointed out, <laughs> that these days people do not know the difference between being famous and being infamous. And I would really have to agree with that. 
On top of that, you know, Andy Warhol talked about 15 minutes of fame, right. but now you can literally have that. You can have, well, with Vine, you can have your uh, five seconds of fame, and uh, it's the, the game has changed. But I will tell you something, why I never want to be famous, and I certainly don't want to be internet famous. Um, I what uh, makes you think that as opposed to uh, as opposed to TV famous? Or? <laughs> well, yeah, there, uh, um, we we uh, I, ju I just don't think I could withstand the uh, world's eye. The scrutiny. The scrutiny. Uh -huh. The scrutiny. The endless twenty-four hour scrutiny. You have to be a pretty strong character right. to 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 um, to do that, and that's what the that's what this show is about. Mm -hmm. Are you? Are you ready for the hell to walk that road? Exactly. Right. You have to be able to withstand a lot if you really want to be famous and get to that certain level. And that, I, I think that is almost like the third message of the show beyond just the surface level and then the, mm -hmm. the correlation with Dante's Inferno is we really are, there really is a message buried in there about what it takes and do you really want this and mm -hmm. is this something that's even worth it, you know? The, the final song is called reach for the stars and it's really about being true to yourself and going for what you want you, you, you define what is your fame the fame that you are comfortable uh -huh. with and then you will be happy that's what makes you famous in your own mind tell us what's going on at thrill peddlers and uh you know we may go back in time a little bit but i want to make sure we touch on that uh, what that experience has been for you guys working with russell blackwood thrill peddlers reviving that material now you're learning new things that you basically are teaching yourself through that time machine that is being sent back right at you. Well, it's interesting because Bertie Bob Watt, who plays the curmudgeonly Sharon in the current production at Thrill Piddlers, Bertie originally played uh, the central character Dante in the original production, but he also, um, you know, it's been 15 years, so he's graduated from Ingenue to the curmudgeonly boat woman. So he's much more suited to the irascible, um, kind of trash-talking Sharon. Uh, but Bertie was the one who carried the torch for this show all these 15 years. And quite honestly, I was so surprised when we got a call out of the blue yes. saying, hey, Russell Blackwood is interested in remounting Club Inferno because they're known for reviving the Cockettes musicals from the 70s. It fits in perfectly with their theater or the ridiculous revivals that they do. And they're a big, what I like to call loosely, a drag factory. I mean, it's all about the costumes and the hair and the makeup. So uh, when Bertie said, oh, he's really interested in doing it, do you want to meet about it? I said, sure, let's do it because I knew Russell puts on high quality shows with great production values, something that Kelly and I never really had the luxury of doing when we were doing it once a week in a rock club south of Market. No great lighting, you know, the, the changing room, the backstage was a broom closet or a men's room where Kelly, who was one of the original dancers, had to change. But bringing it into the present, I think what we have here is, first of all, a much larger stage at hypnodrome.org, and we have great production values, awesome lighting, and fabulous props. You would not believe how incredible the um, the staging and props are. In fact, Kelly was uh, participating in some of the early rehearsals, but I purpose and I and I uh, guided the show all along being the the songwriter, but he uh, purposely I purposely tried to not give away all the surprises until he was there on opening night because I wanted him to see how great they were. And you really were floored by him, weren't you, Kelly? I was, I was really surprised. But but wow, uh, yeah. the show you were asking um, about it you know, when I took a look at it this time, for the reasons that I stated earlier about the uh, about this being an internet culture now, um, its lesson applies more. It seems to more relevant now than it did when we first launched and it. And one of the other reasons why I am really happy, oh, there's the dogs of Cerebrus. They're terrible, Beth, the three-headed dogs. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that makes me really happy about this show is hopefully there is a, there's uh, the, the heads of, uh, decapitated heads of Marie Antoinette, Isadora Duncan, and Jane Mansfield. Uh, what made me really happy about this show is that there was, um, what was happening in San Francisco right now with the closing down of the clubs right. and things like that, uh, there, I was really scared about the drag culture here, uh -huh. especially since Finocchio's has closed down, right. so there's no local place. Um, Oasis just recently opened up, but Oasis doesn't do drag shows. They do, I mean, they don't do well, stuff like Club Inferno. There's shit and champagne. Uh, Darcy is involved. It looks 
pretty good. Oh, I saw Sid and Champagne, which was excellent. They're yes. doing a sequel too, yeah. by the way. Yeah, you know, so, so I think, I think it, 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 it's a surprisingly good thing in the time that we're in, and, right. and a relief, I'd and, say. And so good thing, good for us that uh, we hit it at this time. But we think that we're also augmenting that and uh, and making sure that it continues forward. Uh, Got to get the young kids involved in this Absolutely, culture. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very good news. Like you, when you think San Francisco is going down, maybe uh, like uh, the diehard uh, creative, you know, kernel is maybe reinforced. It's what right. it looks like. Well, that, that's why it's important for for, for theaters like Thrill Peddlers, which uh, keep San Francisco's history alive. And it really is somewhat of a tradition. I mean, I was dinged for referencing the Cockettes and the the and waving the drag flag back in 2000, but when you think about it, there there's nobody else who's doing this sort of crazy drag-based theater, except uh, maybe Darcy over at over at Oasis. Right. To me and Peter, this has been about a rock and roll show, and we rock and roll musical, and we stress that with uh, Russell Blackwood, the director, right from the very beginning. This has got to be rock and roll. It's a rock music. It has to be amplified. We have to have microphones. There have to be loud drums. Yeah. There has to be drums, and there has to be backup dancers, preferably the more like the actors. Um, but uh, you can go to hypnodrome.org, as Peter said, to get tickets, and, um, and we run until the end of August, so we only have 29 performances. I think August 8th, actually. August 8th. Only runs through August 8th. So, so we have 28 performances left, and the tickets seem to be moving fairly quickly. Right. People better, uh, better get moving. Uh, wonderful music. Are you guys heading down to the show now? Yes, I am. Uh, yes. <laughs> I am. Of course I am. Yes. We just quickly, I don't know if you saw this original poster from the original run, which I think is, is very clever, designed by Lee Crow, who is one of the leads. Here is Arturo Galster. If it was worth fighting for. We wrote three numbers specifically for him, so um, he's in the spirit of the show because we got some of his old mm -hmm. drag, that, and we're costuming some of the uh, people right. currently in the show. And that's it for our show. Uh, thank you to uh, Peter and Kelly for thank you, uh, coming to meet the WA, and uh, we'll let you guys go enjoy your show at the Hypnodrome. Work, work, work. And bye-bye. Bring your numbers up, baby, you gotta go.